my really great pleasure to introduce, uh, thank you, our guest uh, Jeremy Wolf uh, from Harvard University. And Jeremy is actually one of the leading scientists in vision sciences, and especially when the vision sciences come to uh, how we find stuff, because Jeremy literally incorporates the field of visual search as no one else. Jeremy got his degree in psychology from Princeton and then moved on to MIT to get his PhD working with Richard Held. And after that, Jeremy uh, took over all sort of very interesting tasks. So among others, he became founder and chair of the MIT program in psychology. Uh, he has become a program committee chair of the American Association for Psychology. Um, governing Board of Psychonomic, Science, uh, Psychonomic Society, and he's an editor or on the editorial board of very important uh, journals in the field like APMP, Vision Cognition, JEP. Jeremy is a professor at Harvard Medical School and he runs the Visual Attention Lab and there he does not only study uh, classical visual search paradigms, but also uh, does more applied work, uh, work uh, that uh, really matter and make all the difference to our lives, like, for example, how medical doctors search through uh, lung CTs for tumors, or how we do baggage screening at the airport security. Not only is Jeremy one of the most creative and smartest scientists I've ever met, uh, he's also a fantastic mentor and supervisor of countless upcoming young researchers who populate uh, vision sciences across the globe now. And furthermore, Jeremy is an incredibly gifted teacher. So for 25 years, he actually uh, taught the famous Introduction to Psychology at MIT, which was so beloved by generations of MIT students. And today, we caught him mid-air on his way from Boston to Abu Dhabi, and we are thrilled to hear a very uh, entertaining and interesting talk, which, is, which has a new title, uh, Dancing Chickens and Gorillas in the Lung, If I Can See So Much, Why the Hell Do I Miss So Much? Yep, I got the thing. I turned it on, right? This sounds like it's on. Yes. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you for, for having me. Um, I, I learned that the skiing is very bad in Abu Dhabi, um, so I thought I should, should stop here on the way. Um, and, and also, well, I don't know if Abu, if Abu Dhabi is beautiful. I've never been there, but I, Rovereto is always beautiful, so it's good to be here. Do I want to turn the lights down? Yeah. Um, so, what am I going to, well, the first thing I'm going to do is thank all sorts of parts of the uh, U.S. government for providing money for, uh, for the work that, uh, that I do. That's probably good. Um, and then, let me tell you the broad plan for the talk. I will tell you, as, as Daniel mentioned, I work on visual search. How do you find what you are looking for? Um, so I will talk a bit about why do we search at all, and then I will say something about why we miss things when we search, why we are not always successful, and um, then I'll say something about why we should care about this sort of, well, we should all care about it in a, uh, in a, in a place like this because we are fascinated by the basic science, but why should all of them care about this? Um, and whoop, there we go. All right, so let me tell you a little bit about um, why we search at all. And um, the, so you have these pictures? Yes. What is he called in Italy? Is Waldo in Italy? OK, in, in, in Germany, it's Vali, right? So, okay. and, you can be looking for Waldo all you like here. He's not in this picture. 
Um, but if I say, uh, where is the lion? You can easily find the lion, right? And um, there are a couple, there are several points that this makes for us. One of them is that there was something that you had to search for the lion. You didn't immediately, when the, the image came up, you did not immediately know there was a lion. But there was something here, right? There was something there before it was a lion. So what is that? That is, we, we can call that problem the problem of pre-attentive vision. What is it that is seen at a location before attention arrives there? Then we have the problem of attention. How do you get attention onto the lion? And we can also ask about the problem of post-attentive vision, which is if I, if I say, OK, now move your attention to this pink bus, is this, is this still a lion in the same sense? You know cognitively that there's still a lion here, but is it still visually a lion um, in the same way? And I'll try to say a little bit about each of these, each of these problems. Um, the pre-attentive problem uh, goes back quite a long way. The uh, French philosopher Condillac was talking about it in the 18th century. He did not use the term pre-attentive. Um, but what he was imagining was a situation where you come to a chateau at nighttime, and um, in the morning, your host opens the curtains, and he asks, what's the first thing that you see? And, he's, uh, and, and, and he says that you will just see little regions of color and, and form. You won't initially know what you are looking at. And this is really a lovely description of pre-attentive vision um, before we had the, 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 this language for it. I don't have a chateau, um, but I have curtains here. So I will open these curtains for you, and then I need you to tell me what you see. All right, you ready? OK, what did you see? You have to say this louder. Crosses. Oh. Crosses, crosses. OK, some kids, we got, we got crosses. What else? X, so X, so we, get, we got cross and X. We got that part. OK, uh, or we have to, we'll, we will lead the audience a little. Were there any colors? Yes. What colors did you see? Red, green, Red. yellow, blue. Black, thank you. Nobody says purple because there was no purple. So, so you said you saw some pluses, good. Um, colors, I had to ask you, but you knew that it's red and green and blue and yellow. Um, you saw some X's, so you were getting something about the orientation. Um, did you see this plus or this plus? OK, I heard left, I heard right, I heard both. Those are the possibilities, thank you. Um, <laughs> So I'll show you what you saw. This is, this is the original image. And, and both is the right answer. There are examples of red vertical and red horizontal here. But the really important point here is you were guessing. You have no idea. You knew absolutely that you see red, green, blue, yellow, x's, pluses. That you get everywhere immediately, pre-attentively. But how those features go together, you do not know. That's what you need attention for. So this, before attention arrives, this is red and green and vertical and horizontal. So is this, also red, green, vertical, and horizontal. They're essentially the same thing before your attention arrives. You need attention. Whoops. Oh, we'll do this here. Let's demonstrate this. So, I want you to look for this target, the one with the red vertical and green horizontal. This time I won't flash it, I leave it up there. OK, so you don't have to, you can sleep a little bit. Um, you ready? Yeah, you feel good because you found it pretty quickly. Now you notice, oh, there's quite a lot of them, like half of them. Uh, yeah, yeah, OK, and there's, there's the A plus student. He found the one over here, right? So the important point here is that the minute that image comes on the screen, you know red and green pluses everywhere. 
But only when you start deploying your attention from item to item do you know if they are the red vertical kind or the, uh, the green vertical kind. Um, so this is, and, and this is called binding, binding features to uh, objects. I wish I could claim it was my idea. It's really Anne Treisman's idea. That's why she is wearing this <laughs> and standing next to him. I won't say anything about current presidents in the United States, but um, this is, this is the, uh, the United States National Medal of Science. She got it because you can't tell the difference between those pluses, so. Um, so, most of the targets that are out there in the world, so this, this, this demonstration is very deliberately set up to make life difficult for you because everything was red and green and vertical and horizontal. Most of the time, the world is not like that, right? So here's a, a, a step towards something closer to the real world. I want you to look for the line that is red and vertical among lines that are red but not vertical and vertical but not red, okay? And uh, oh, you can clap when you find a, a, a target. This is, so what we would do in the lab, typically, is measure response times and accuracy. So resp response times for a crowd, if you clap, you can hear the reaction, t you can hear the response time, the reaction time. Um, all right, so you're looking for, for that. Ready, good, okay. So the interesting question is, um, is how do you do this? Um, and the interesting answer seems to be roughly, though Daniel might have an argument with me about this, I'm not sure. You have mechanisms early in the visual system that will give you, so you get redness anywhere you, you want it, so where's the red stuff? Okay, where is the vertical stuff? And I can do an intersection operation that says, okay, I don't know where the red vertical thing is without binding those features, but if I look at places that have red and that have vertical, that's a really good place to look. So there'll be a few places that you um, think might be likely targets, and yes, yeah, so some of them turn out to work out. Um, and this, uh, this, we call this guided search, the search is guided by the basic features that you have access to pre-attentively. Um, so I have spent many years working on a model of guided search. We keep numbering them because every time you come up with a model, the model is wrong. And you don't want people yelling at you about a model that you know is wrong. So if you want to yell about at, at my model, now you have to yell at, at version five. We're up to... <laughs> version five of this. But the basic idea is pretty straightforward and has stayed the same. If you are trying to find something um, where binding is required, you use the basic feature information to guide your attention to those targets. Now, there's a limited set of features that you can use to guide your attention. I, color we saw already, uh, orientation, curvature, something about shape that we don't really quite understand, um, and then some more complicated things like lighting direction. There's a list of maybe one to two dozen features that can guide your attention, and that's it. And even within a feature, they are very coarse. So in orientation, you don't say, I would like to find everything that is 10 degrees to the left. You can say left, that's probably right for you, right, left, steep, shallow. If I was any good, I'd say that in Italian, but I can't. Um, and that's it. It's like four, four terms in orientation. A size, big, small, that's it. You can't even guide your attention to the medium size. So very few, a few features, coarsely defined, that's what guides your attention around. And a lot of things don't work. Um, so here, it would take you a minute to see what 
maybe the feature, the proposed feature was altogether, but if you look for an X junction among T junctions, very slow. You can tell the difference between this and this, but not, not, without, not without attention. Um, perhaps the most controversial one is faces. There are claims in the literature for um, the ability to detect facial, to familiar faces or faces of specific emotion. Um, I won't talk about this extensively, but I think the, the, the pattern of results here has been over the years. Somebody says, oh, you can find angry faces pre-attentively, and then somebody else finds the, the stimulus artifact. Um, and I would say that you do not have an ability to guide to specific kinds of faces. Other people would disagree with me, and I would disagree with them. Um, but so faces you can fight about. If you're a face person, it's OK. Um, all right, so this is, um, this is basic guided search. There's more to guidance than just these basic features. And I thank Melissa Vo in large part for bringing that to, uh, to my lab some years ago, but not this picture. I forget, have you seen this picture? You have seen this picture. OK, anyway. This is a, I made this picture originally um, because we'll see later. Um, I, I, I've been working with radiologists. And if you're looking for lung cancer in an x-ray, what you're looking for are so-called lung nodules, which are basically small, white, round structures in the lung. OK, so small, white, round, look for golf balls. All right? Let's see. How did you do? You found that one, yeah? You feel good because you found that one? You didn't find those five? No, you missed that one too. Now, think about it. What's one of the things that is interesting here is that the ones that you missed, particularly that one, is, that's this, is more salient than the ones that you found. So you know, if you wrote a little piece of MATLAB code to find um, those golf balls, it would find those perfectly easily. Um, but you didn't. Now, why did you, why did you fail? You failed because you guide your attention not only to the features of the target you are looking, you, you are, you are looking for, but you also guide your attention to the properties, based on the properties of the scene. Where is it likely that you will find something? So if I am uh, looking for, oh, I can look for Clayton, because I don't even, I haven't found, oh, there he is. So I just found Clayton. He's sitting way out in the back. Um, that's good. It would be embarrassing if it turned out he wasn't here. Um, that's a target absent trial, but it would still be embarrassing. Anyway, how did I look for him? So I'm looking for objects of human size, scaled by distance. That's an interesting, different problem. But I'm looking for objects of human size, maybe roughly vertical, and human shape is good too. Um, but I also, when I'm searching for Clayton, I spent no time looking at the chandelier and no time looking at blank areas of the wall, because he's just not going to be there. The properties of the scene will guide my attention uh, also. And we can use language borrowed from the study of language to talk about these properties. And I will define them in ways that Melissa never likes. But I'm close. Um, but you can talk about syntactic or structural guidance, places where um, objects could be. So uh, a, a, a good example of um, a syntactic violation in Clayton's search would be he shouldn't be floating in the air because, because people don't float, right? Um, and semantic guidance would be um, where it's meaningful for the object to be, where it's sensible for the object to be, even if it's physically possible. So um, you know, Clayton could have been lying on this table. Nothing physically wrong with that, but it would have been a little strange. 
So that would be, that would be semantic um, guidance. Um, that's Melissa. Melissa, Melissa uh, came to my lab saying that she thinks that these are um, really separable processes in the brain like um, uh, uh, the actual linguistic processing that they are named after. And so she took a whole collection of pictures, half of them in my living room, I think, where you have, um, you know, here's a sensible scene where the mouse is sitting next to the computer. Here is a semantic violation where that, what's that soap doing next to the computer? It's perfectly legal, but it doesn't make any sense. Um, and here's a sort of a syntactic violation where um, it's physically possible, but the computer, uh, the, the, the mouse has no business being here. Um, and, well, the, I, I will, when you want the details about this, you talk to Melissa. But the short answer is that syntactic and semantic violations actually have different uh, signals in ERP. They really seem to be different types of information that the brain is using to guide your attention um, around a scene. Um, so we have this notion that in the beginning of your visual system, you know, your retina is taking in information from everywhere. There is a very powerful bottleneck in that processing that allows you to bind the features, but only of one or many, maybe a very small number of objects at the same time. Access to that bottleneck, the ability to go into that bottleneck, is controlled by this guiding mechanism. So if you're looking for the red vertical line, you feed red things into here, because those are the ones you want to bind. Um, and then you end up recognizing that bound object in some fashion. But if you go back to that lion at the beginning, something, there's a non-selective pathway that's allowing something to get in from everywhere. So you see something everywhere, um, and you only recognize maybe one object or a few objects at any one moment. I can give you a little bit of a feeling for this idea of seeing something everywhere. Here's some more clapping part. This time, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you um, one image after the other very quickly. And you have to clap when you see the uh, a, 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 a chimpanzee. You ready? Is this, where's my little mouse? There it goes. OK, this is easy. Right? Every, if you didn't get it, that's OK. Um, but uh, you know, it happens. But um, so th there are a couple of things that are interesting here. One is that you can do this task very quickly. But more interesting for us is that as each of those images goes by, you know what it is. Not precisely. You can't count the number of trees or the, you don't, uh, if, if I said what color were the windows in the house or something, you wouldn't quite know. But as each image comes up, you know beach, forest, city, uh, street, something like that. You get the gist of the image very quickly. And so we get the idea that what you are seeing at any one moment is not just, so it's a little more complicated than what Condiac thought, not just color and shape. You get some meaning out of the scene, and that we can call the gist. You get one or maybe a small number of objects that you are binding right now, and you have a theory. The theory piece is well, in a sense, the piece that would be there if you closed your eyes, right? So my claim is that right now I am seeing something everywhere, and it has the gist of a room full of people. I am binding one person at a time, maybe, which sounds a little strange in that context. I am binding Daniel. Mm. Yeah, that's weird. Um, and the theory is I'm, I, that, that this is a room full of, of, of people who, uh, who haven't all fallen asleep yet. Good. Um, so, you know, and, and that would be true even if I closed my eyes, right? So we can illustrate that with some beautiful dancing chickens. 
Okay, so um, you have the gist of sort of chicken stuff everywhere. My claim is that you were only binding one chicken at a time. And you have a theory. Well, the theory is probably I shouldn't try to make my living doing animation. Um, but um, the result of this, so you also have a naive theory. Everybody out on the street has a theory. I'm seeing everything everywhere. Right? I see all these people, I recognize them all. Well, if that was true, you would have seen the chicken who fell apart. Now, there are maybe 40 people here, there are 20 chickens, so there are two, maybe three people, not counting Melissa, who saw the chickens before, um, who saw the chicken fall apart. One, ooh, ooh, this is a very advanced group. We're up to six. Um, and the rest of you are sitting there saying, oh, Everybody saw this image twice. Um, it's not just that you weren't looking straight at it. If you look over here, you can easily tell still that that chicken is falling apart. It's that if you were not paying attention to the chicken when it fell apart, it simply did not register. You could, it didn't disrupt the, the gist you know, chicken stuff everywhere, you know, oops, where'd my chicken bits go? There's still chicken bits. Um, it, didn't, um, uh, it didn't disrupt your memory, and you just didn't bind that object. So you did not know that it, it, it was there anywhere. Um, and now you may have noticed that this one has, has, has fallen apart on you. So um, at any given moment, you see something everywhere, but you see less than you think you saw. Um, this is part of the answer to why do we miss things. You think you have looked at everything, but you haven't bound all of the objects, and you stop looking before, uh, before you find everything. Um, well, OK, so dancing chickens are nice, uh, but why, why, should you actually, uh, why should you actually care about it? You should care about these things because we pay, well, because there are very important tasks that we do um, and that we get experts to do that require these processes. Um, there are very important tasks we do all day long, right? Where is my cat? This is very important, um, but we don't pay experts to look for your cat, mostly. But we pay experts to uh, look through x-rays of luggage for guns, bombs, and knives. We pay experts to look at, uh, this is a, ma uh, a mammogram looking for breast cancer. Um, we pay the intelligence community to look at photographs and try to figure out, I don't remember where this is, this is maybe Iraq, but you know, what's going on on the ground here. And there is good reason to think that mistakes that are made, that many of the mistakes that are made in these sorts of tasks are made uh, because of problems with visual attention. Not personality problems because the, the, the screener was lazy, not, not because the image is invisible, but really problems with attention. Um, how do we know that? One way we know that is because of <coughs> uh, this sort of a phenomenon. So in North America, um, breast cancer screening, 20 to 30 percent of cancers are missed on screening. So already you know you have something that you would like to work on. It's a real problem. Um, and if you are, the, 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 the way screening works is women are screened every year or two after the age of 40 or 50. I don't know what the Italian um, program is. So if you find something in 2017, the first thing you are going to do is look at the images from 2015, 2016, because you want to know if this is changing. That's, that, that would be clinically important. And what you discover at very high rates is that the cancer you found in 2017 is retrospectively visible. That means you could see it on last year's scan. And um, it's not that we think that large numbers of radiologists 
are bad or lazy or something. It's just that there's a very big difference between saying, is there cancer here? That's what you're doing in screening. Or saying, is that cancer? Right, where you, where you point at it. And that's what you're doing when you find out that it's retrospectively visible. Um, I think actually that the, the, there's a problem in here, but um, none of us, and well actually, anybody a radiologist here? No, we're short of radiologists. Um, so, this suggests a search failure. And so it is interesting to ask how the rules that we know about search in um, you know, the, the basic laboratory situation, how they would apply in these real world, socially important kinds of search tasks. Um, so let me tell you a few things about this. This is, this is an example, but not from my own, um, my own work. Um, here what you have are eye movement traces as radiologists look uh, at a lung, at a, at a lung x-ray. And what you have is first year student all the way through to expert. And what you can see and what happens over and over in um, eye tracking as expertise develops is that becoming an expert means that you look at less. You, uh, part of, well, you've already done this. When the, the, the golf ball example, the reason you failed to find those weird golf balls is because you are miniature golf experts in some sense. You know where it makes sense to look for golf balls. And so if you walk into a weird lecture, you might miss the ones that I pasted in the sky. But normally you will find, if, if there are golf balls to be found, you will find them. And so when you are a novice, you don't know where in this lung it makes sense for there to be lung nodules or whatever. You look everywhere. When you are an expert, you can say, this piece of lung today, this is like sky. There's just nothing there. I don't need to examine it. This piece of lung I, I, need, um, I need to look at. So you learn where, to, where not to look is an important part of becoming a, a, a search expert. Um, let me tell you something about the gist, this, this idea of gist processing um, in expert search. We'll, we'll, we'll stick with uh, cancer here. One of the interesting things that you learn when you work with search experts like radiologists, um, but I've heard the same story from uh, intelligence community people and from um, a, a baggage screening people, Sometimes they say, when that image first comes up on the screen, I know it's bad, or I know it's interesting, or something. I have a feeling. Well, that's nice. Um, we don't know if this feeling means anything, so um, we thought we would find out. Is there really maybe a gist of breast cancer? Um, and so what we did, um, was we flashed the image, we, we, we got some radiologists, and we said, here, look at this, boop, boop, okay. Tell us, would you recall this woman? Would you bring her back for further exams? The first time we tried this, they got angry with us. They said, I would never do medical diagnosis in a quarter of a second. And we said, yes, yes, we understand that. This is an experiment. Um, but it, it, was, it was a nice cultural violation problem. Um, they were actually offended by our paradigm. So we learned to talk very nicely to them. We, in this case, is most notably Carla Evans, now at York, um, who was a postdoc in the lab. Michelle Green was also a postdoc, and Diane uh, Georgian Smith and Robin Birdwell are radiologists from my, uh, from my hospital. And oh, and we ran the experiment at it's very hard to test radiologists, right? Uh, so do you require your first year uh, undergraduates to be um, subjects in psychology experiments? Or do you pay them? Both. What, both, okay. Not to, you don't just round them up with a, a, a cattle prod and the, no, okay, good. It is very hard to say, you know, we're looking for radiologists, we'll pay you $10. 
or something. You just don't get radiologists that way. So we went to the Society for Breast Imaging meeting and, um, and set up a little lab and tested them there, which worked pretty well. Uh, Car Carla and Michelle did the testing, and they said it was working well until um, the cocktail hour got too far along, and then the data started going downhill. But anyway, uh, <coughs> so here's how you, uh, here, here's what we're going to do. This is a standard so-called ROC, receiver operating characteristic picture, for the <coughs> those of you who are familiar with uh, signal detection measures. I'm going to plot the false alarm rate on the x-axis, the hit rate, the, the, the true positive rate on the y-axis. So if you're guessing, the data will just lie on that diagonal. And if you're not guessing, the, the, the per perfect performance is up in the upper left-hand corner. And, and, and here's what happens. They're not perfect in a quarter of a second or going up to two seconds here. But you can see that radiologists are beating chance. You're doing better than chance um, in a very brief exposure to, um, to a mammogram. And um, interestingly, so we were asking people, um, OK, tell us if you'd bring her back. OK, give us a, a number that says how confident you are in that confidence rating. And also, um, look, we know that you're not really that sure, but here's an outline of the breast. Put a dot where you think the problem is, if there's a problem. And so here's confidence increasing from lousy to great. And here is how good that mark was. And you can see the dotted line is chance. They, were get, they had no idea where the problem was. They just knew that there's something wrong here. Um, and and that's, that's actually a good mark of a gist kind of processing. It's a global process across the whole, um, across the whole image. Oh, they're right, by the way. They should not do diagnosis in a quarter of a second. So that pink square up there is about where a, a, a really good radiologist lives. Um, you can see they're still missing, you know, they're, they're, they're false alarming on something over 10% and, and they're missing some percentage of them as well. But they do, you, you do much better if you actually spend some time with the, uh, with the image. So there's something maybe going through this non-selective pathway that is telling the radiologist um, that there's something suspicious here. And it's not just that they got lucky and they were looking straight at the cancer. Um, so what's the signal? If we could find that signal, that would potentially be uh, valuable. We might be able to train radiologists to look for it. We might be able to train the computer to look for it. So here's one way to find out. We're going to repeat the experiment showing the normal breast image. Or we're going to filter it. We can low-pass filter, um, or we can high-pass filter. High-pass filter gives you the finicky, finicky little details, like a cartoon almost. Low-pass gives you is basically blurring. Um, the, uh, oh, wait, we can, do, we can do a poll here. If you had to guess how many people vote there's a signal here, how many people vote that there's more signal in the low-pass versus how many vote for the high pass signal. So how many people vote for signal in the low pass? OK. How many people vote for signal in the high pass? How many people say, nobody's making me vote here. I'm just going <laughs> to. They got me with the golf balls. I'm not playing this game again. <laughs> um, all right, so didn't get much of an interesting result to my poll here. I'll show you the answer. Here's the basic replication of the original finding. Uh, the dotted lines are from individual subjects. So you can see everybody is lying above chance. Here's the, the high spatial frequency, the high pass filter data. It's about the same. The low spatial frequency is much worse. Um, if you are a normal scene or low level vision person, that's backwards from what you might have expected. Um, normally, you think that in a brief flash, you just get the low spatial frequency. 
information, but actually, apparently, it's the high spatial frequencies where the signal lies. That's sort of interesting. Oh, if any of you happen to be mammography experts, you will know that one of the signs, one of the risk factors for breast cancer is so-called dense breasts. Um, this is a, a undense breast. That's a, a, a dense breast. You can see, if nothing else, that it would be harder to find stuff there. But there's a, a biological risk factor beyond. Um, the signal we're looking at is not breast density. It's the, their performance is uncorrelated with breast density. So something in the high spatial frequencies, not density. Um, we were thinking, we were showing, the, the, the way that, uh, that, that uh, radiologists typically look at these images initially is a, a pair of breasts, left, left and right, unsurprisingly. Um, the, uh, and we thought maybe, that, that, well, radiologists will tell you one of the things they are looking for is symmetry because asymmetry is um, a sign of abnormality. So were they just looking at some sort of subtle asymmetry in the breasts we were showing? So there's a pretty easy way to look at that. Let's just show one breast. Um, when you do that, again, we can replicate the basic result um, that uh, if you just flash one breast, um, they are comfortably above chance knowing whether that's normal or abnormal. But the really interesting result here was that it worked if you showed them the breast contralateral to the cancer on the other side, right? So this woman has a lesion in the uh, left breast, let's say. We flash the right breast and it's a weaker signal, but again, above chance levels, there's something about the, if you like, the texture of this otherwise normal breast that says this is a breast from an abnormal patient. And that's, that's, that's interesting because it suggests, among other things, that maybe you could look for this before the cancer develops at all. Which is, that's, and that's where we are right now with this work. We're now looking to see whether there's a signal in, um, in the breast that, uh, uh, in, in, in patients who don't yet have the cancer. Um, so the, uh, the, the, the punchline here is there's a global signal. It's present in the breast that's got the, the cancer in it, the, the overt lesion in it, but it's also present in the other, in the other breast. Um, all right, how are we doing? Oh, I can give you another example or two. So um, let's switch gears here and talk a little more about dancing chickens. And so I, I, most of you are probably familiar with, well, I should ask, how many of you are familiar with the, the, the great gorilla experiment of Dan Simons? I'm not seeing everybody's hand here. Now I'm seeing everybody's hand because they feel embarrassed if they're... Okay, I quickly tell you this experiment. You're watching this video, and they're passing the ball around, and you have to say how many times the people with the white shirts touch the ball. Um, it's you know, not impossible. It's a hard task. So while you are watching that, a woman in a gorilla suit walks through the middle of the, ex uh, of, of the video Oops, hits her microphone um, and walks out. And then afterwards, you, you're asked, how many times did the white team touch the ball? Yeah, OK, that's good. Did you see anything else? Mm -hmm. No. Did you see maybe a gorilla? And it's like the destroyed chicken thing. They say, what? And then you show them the movie again, and they say, oh, yeah, that gorilla. So you miss it completely. Um, and uh, so, so we wondered whether or not being an expert makes, it, um, makes you immune to this. In this case, we is uh, Traft and Drew, now at Utah, previous postdoc with me. Um, so we had people, this is, this is one slice of, oh, did I bring the whole movie? I don't remember. Um, this is one slice of a chest CT. So you don't just get a chest x-ray now, you get a CT scan, which is like 300 slices through the chest. 
and the radiologist is using a thumb wheel, say, to scroll back and forth and is looking for golf balls. And on the last case of this experiment, where we're tracking their eyes and telling them that they are, that's what we're doing, we put in a gorilla. Um, this is, if, if this was physiologically real, it would be about this big. Um, and, uh, and 20 of 24 radiologists failed to mention it at all, uh, which it, there are several things to say about this. One is they were guiding their attention to small, white, and round. That's going to make them less likely to find big, black, and shaggy. You might think this is very unfair because they would never be looking for a gorilla. But if you are a radiologist, your job, so if you're, you're a radiologist doing lung cancer screening, what you are taught is report whether there are signs of lung cancer and also report anything else of clinical interest. That's so-called, these are so-called incidental findings. Um, and they're not joking about this. If you, at least in the United States, if you miss these, um, there is a lawyer who is ready to sue you for, uh, uh, take you to court. Um, my hospital is currently dealing with a $14 million settlement or a, a judgment because um, the, uh, the, the patient came in. The question that was asked was, does this woman have pneumonia? The radiologist looked at the, the um, images and correctly said, no, she does not have pneumonia. But she, he missed in this case that she did have lung cancer. And at the moment, um, that's $14 million worth of search error. So finding the, the weird thing in an image is very much something that radiologists want to be able to do. Um, and 20 of 24 of them missed it here. It's not, by the time I show it in this setting, it's a little hard to see. But if I tell you, or I tell a radiologist, you know, look for lung nodules, and oh, by the way, we might have snuck a gorilla in there, 100% will find the gorilla. If I take naive subjects and flash an image for a quarter of a second and say, was there a gorilla there? It's over 90% correct. It's an easy gorilla to find, but if you're looking for lung nodules, you don't find it. And it's important to say that these are, again, it's like, like the earlier example, it's not lazy, bad radiologists or anything like that. What it means is that radiologists, other experts, are working with the same search engine that you and I work with. Becoming an expert doesn't mean that you build a new visual system. It means you learn how to use the tools that you have, um, but you also are still subject to the, uh, to the same problems, the same sorts of I missed the golf ball kind of errors that the rest of us would be, uh, be subject to. Um, this, this particular finding has probably gotten more notice out in the broader world than anything else I've ever done. Um, well, gorillas in the lung, you know, it's kind of catchy. Uh, and it made it big in radiology social media. You may not know that radiologists have social media, but they're, you know, everybody's got social media, right? And so the comments on social media websites fell into um, sort of two categories. One was radiologists saying, we knew that. And the other was radiologists saying, I wouldn't have missed the gorilla. They may have known that, but I think they would have missed the gorilla anyway. Um, and, and in fact, one of the interesting aspects of these so-called inattentional blindness effects is that, um, you know, I've shown you this now. I can't fool you again with the chickens or, you know, you'll look for a gorilla next time you see a lung CT. But I, I could pull another half dozen uh, examples off the internet and get you with every one of them. Simply knowing that this happens doesn't make you immune to it. It's, uh, th th these, are, these are powerful effects. All right, one more story. Um, 
Let me tell you a word about uh, airport security, um, or at least an experiment that started in airport security land. Um, so here's the task that you're trying to do if you're an airport screener. An interesting piece of sociology, or whatever you like, is that uh, radiologists who are doing these very difficult tasks, they get paid lots of money, we respect them greatly, doctor, doctor. The poor guy at the airport who's doing this task, very difficult task. At least in the lung, the ribs are in the same place each time. You know, think about the way you packed the last time you went someplace. You know, <laughs> and then you threw a pile of electronics on top of it just for fun. And that's what they're trying to figure out. Um, so, uh, well, have you, anybody see a threat? Yes or no? That's a no. How about this one? I can't hear you. No, that's good. Uh, that's all. So th this is important, actually. Most of the time, of course, at the airport, the answer is no. That you don't want to be at the airport where most of the time the answer is yes. Yeah, yeah, what did you find? Yeah, yeah, that's a knife. Right. Knives are the easy stuff. Knives and guns are the easy stuff. What you're looking for mostly are guns, bombs, and knives. When we've done this in the lab, we only do knives and guns because bombs are too hard. Um, because, you know, it's not like the old cartoons. The bomb is like a thing where a fuse <laughs> on top. Um, what you're looking for, if you're, let's see, do I have a good example here? Okay, this would be pretty good. What you're looking for, the, the colors are not arbitrary. This is a dual energy x-ray. Blue means metal. Orange means organic. Green is in between. Um, what you're looking for, if you're looking for an explosive, is a chunk of organic material big enough to be a piece of plastic explosive that could blow a hole in a plane. And you're looking for a detonator, um, something that's going to set it off. And that's typically, well, if you want to test the airport security at your airport, I do not suggest this is a good idea unless you didn't want to go home to visit your mother or whatever. But uh, you take, take uh, like a sausage, right, and take the, uh, the earbuds from your, uh, uh, your iPod or whatever, wrap it around the sausage, and, and stick the little probe into the sausage. Um, that, that's basically what you're looking for. Except the problem is that, that, you know, plastic explosive is plastic because it can be any shape. Um, and if you think about the electronics in your bag, there's tons of it in there. And what we're doing here is taking three dimensions and <laughs> squashing it into two. And so what they're looking for is some hunk of orange with something metallic that is interacting in a suspicious way. Very, very hard task. Um, so, the part that we were interested in is whether or not it matters that what you're looking for is very rare, right? You're not, you know, sometimes they're finding water bottles, that's nice, but, but basically um, they're not finding, well, in the U.S. you are finding targets at a low rate um, because the machine that makes these has a library of threat images and it projects knives and bombs into your luggage at the, at the checkpoint. Now, with luck, the screener finds the, 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 the knife. They don't immediately tell the police to jump on you. They say, that's a knife. And the computer says, yes, I put that knife in there. Now please look at the bag again. So if you've been to the airport and your bag goes back through for a second time, one of the reasons, there are many reasons for doing that, but one of the reasons is they had one of these images projected into your bag and they want to, it's embarrassing to let you on the plane with your gun just because they found the fake gun. So they want to check again. Um, so anyway, I can't tell you how often they do that, by the way, because it's a secret. <laughs> and I promised I wouldn't. Um, so we did an experiment where uh, we did the, this is now with um, 
people in the lab. And again, they're just looking for guns and knives. So let's take, let's imagine we have 20 bags that have guns and knives in them. And we can put those in a stack of 40 bags. So on average, there's a threat on 50% of the bags. Or we can put them in a stack of 1,000 uh, bags. So now there's only threats on 2%. Same threats, right? You, you, you see what's going on? So now we can ask, um, what does this do to the data? Oh, first, my official government warning. Um, like I said, these are not airport screeners. These are people in the lab. If I was showing you data from airport screeners, um, I couldn't put the real error rate on the, on the y-axis. That's also a, a secret. I can tell you that the error rate is above zero, but you knew that. Um, but but uh, so th th these, are, these are data from the lab. But OK, here is high prevalence, target on 50% of the trials. With these particular stimuli and these particular subjects, we miss 20% of them. Same exact threats, now at low prevalence, they miss twice as many. Right? So the, the shorthand is that if you don't um, find it often, you often don't find it. That rare things are missed more often. If you look at the false alarms, those errors go the other way. If you're a signal detection person, you will recognize this as the image of a criterion shift. And that's a big piece of this effect. It's not the whole story, but it's a big piece. But OK, that's the lab. In the last minute and a half, would this ever happen in the real world? So we did this in, we'll go back to mammography land, um, with a bit of work, again, Carla Evans did the main part of the work, we um, slid cases into normal practice at the hospital where we knew the truth, right? And, and, and so we could do, we could have a low prevalence situation in the hospital. So we had. 100 cases, 50 with cancer, 50 without. We either had them slow, less than one case a day at the hospital, or all read at once, all 100 read at once. So this is the high prevalence, that's low prevalence. Here's what the data look like. Um, they miss twice as many at low prevalence as at high prevalence. And what you should really remember here is that this is a bunch of radiologists doing me a favor. This is radiologists in the clinic trying to keep, uh, you know, save women from cancer. Right? So this is, you know, it's not just motivation. This is, this is where they should be motivated. Just by being rare, they seem to be missing about twice as many of um, the cancers. So if you could do something about this, you could potentially find many more cancers than you are currently finding. I won't go into the details, but these are real radiologists. Uh, not real, real airport screeners. And at uh, high prevalence, they do better than at low prevalence. And you cannot possibly make anything out of this uh, y-axis, because it's a very weird axis on purpose, because I'm a good boy. Um, all right, so the bottom line here is that Understanding how the human search engine works does have real implications for problems that we really care about um, in, in the real world. That we really, if we could understand enough about human search to um, figure out how to cure some of these problems, we would literally be saving lives, probably. And that's not a bad reason for, uh, for doing this kind of research part quite apart from the fact that it's fun. Um, so all right, uh, now you should know something about why we search. I've told you something about why we miss things. I hope I have told you why you should care, which leaves me to say thank you. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And I should have said at the beginning, my, my apologies um, and intense gratitude for being able to, to, to give lectures in English, right? Because I cannot function in any other language 
Um, and I'm just lucky that we make everybody do science in English at this point. Um, so thank you. I feel guilty about it. And you should ask questions, even if you say, but it's not my first language. I feel like Jack. Are you in the spotlight now? Yeah, exactly. So I'll, thank you again for the talk. I uh, was wondering when we were watching this, all these pictures of uh, mammographies. Like I read, I read in a, um, somewhere I don't remember actually where, but like one solution to this attentional problem is to to ask multiple radiologists to make the same evaluation on the same on the same picture. And uh, I'm wondering whether like attention. Uh, this attention problem actually can be decreased by having multiple evaluations over the same stimulus. And yeah, so there are a couple. So the question is, why not double read all the, all the mammograms? Well, you, actually, you were going for multiple. Um, double read. The, uh, in several European countries, uh, every mammogram is double read. Um, and that does, and it certainly does uh, cut down on error rates. It particularly cuts down on the false positive rate, actually. That, so there are two errors here. One is the one that we tend to focus on is, oh my goodness, we missed this cancer. But um, in the US, you recall, you, you bring back for more exams 10% of women um, at considerable cost and at real psychological cost. It, it, it's, very, uh, it's very scary to be told we need to look at more. Um, and double reading cuts down on, on, on those uh, errors. Not done in the US. Um, one of the reasons, the primary reason, is it's expensive. That um, getting the, the radiologists are already um, complaining very loudly about the workload. And you, you, can't, you can't trivially double it. Um, it, it, it it's, uh, it, it, that's, that's a tricky problem. The other interesting problem is that um, these, the errors are not independent. Right? You'd get big bang for uh, double reading tasks. We, we tried this with the prevalence problem. Right? We, we, we told Homeland Security, you know, the airport security people in the US, that we were going to solve their problem. You know, you're making 30% errors in this task that we were showing them. Um, well, gee, if we get two people to look at that, that's 0.3 times 0.3. <laughs> we're down to 9% uh, error. Great. Um, but the errors are highly correlated. The, the cases that you miss at low prevalence, both people will miss even though they might both find the same ones at, at high prevalence. So double reading is certainly helpful. Um, it's not as helpful as you would like, and it's expensive. So you know, there's, there are various solutions that are like, uh, that, that go down this path. One possibility is um, don't, um, uh, don't get too expensive doctors to look at both images. Train um, some baggage screeners or something to look at the image and get them to look with very uh, uh, liberal threshold. You know, anything that looks suspicious, I want you to give me 20% of these cases I want you to say look suspicious. And then the radiologist only reads those 20%. That's one way, that, that, that's a possible way to do it. It's got its own problems, but uh, anyway, it's a good idea that doesn't quite work as well as we would hope. What else have we got? Just wondering, just if, for example, if you use exogenous cueing to, to kind of guide people to these images, because the moment you point out, hey, there is a gorilla, and I know that you can't point out every single pixel on, on a, an image, but if you used 
a very structural, exogenous cue, say, follow this, follow this, follow that, and tell me yes or no, yes or no, yes or no, yes or no. Have you, have you thought about using something so, like that to guide? To guide yeah, so of course, you, what you can't do is cue the gorilla, because if you knew where the gorilla was, the game is over already. So then you just get you know, the computer to do it. Um, but there are various strategies. Um, if you are doing satellite images, right, you're trying to decide, did the North Koreans build a new missile base? Um, the standard thing to do is to force uh, a pattern of uh, basically moving systematically through the image. That, you know, that, that's one way. It's not, not quite an exogenous cue. It's just a, a, a forced pattern. But the principle is the same. You want to get people to cover everything. You can be smarter about this by running a, um, uh, an algorithm over your image and saying, make sure you look here, 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 and here. Um, because we think those are the interesting places um, in this image. Those are so-called computer-aided detection systems. Um, and they have their own interesting problems. So if, if you could build the computer to just do the task, it's, you're, you're done. Right? And, and uh, I was just at, a couple of months ago now, the, the, the big radiology meeting, which was full of deep learning uh, discussion and papers, because the radiologists are scared to death that the, the, the next smart deep learning network simply puts them out of business. Not yet, don't worry about it, but, um, but anyway, if you could do that, then it's the, 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 the deep learning network really doesn't have attention problems in the same way. But now what we've got is computer systems that can find, let's say, 90% of the cancers and false alarms on 10% of images. And that's about as good as an expert radiologist. But it's not good enough to work by yourself. So it puts marks on the image to tell the radiologist, look here and look here. Um, and you have a good radiologist and a good computer, and you put them together, and you get almost no benefit. And that's an interesting mystery why this is the case. One of the reasons seems to be this prevalence problem. So imagine you have a, hundred, a thousand cases, and they're in, in, that will typically give you three cancers in a screening population. OK, let's say the computer finds all three. It also finds a hundred um, false positives. And it delivers that now to the radiologist. OK, that means that any given mark has about a 3% chance of being valid. If I ask you where I should eat dinner in Rovereto, and your advice is good 3% of the time, how much do I listen to you? Not so much. And that seems to be what goes on in the lab. There's a lovely data point by a colleague of mine at Pittsburgh, Bob Nishikawa, Radiologist reads the image, then the CAD system, computer-aided detection system, reads the image. And on some trials, the radiologist had missed the cancer, and now the CAD system points to it. On 70% of those cases, the radiologist did not change his or her decision. They ignored that mark because, I think, we haven't done the research, but I think because those marks are just too unreliable. So the pointing the radiologist in the right direction works, um, but you have to get the system to work even better than it does now. Melissa. I think you forgot to mention that's that even, I don't know, 70% or I don't know how many of the radiologists actually they looked at the gorilla. So oh, we yes, saw, I should. We saw that they actually fixated the gorilla, but still didn't report it. Yeah, the, the, voice of the, the voice of the eye movement person to remind <laughs> me that, yeah, on average, um, in the gorilla study, radiologists looked at that gorilla for a full second without, without registering it. And you think, how could that possibly be? Um, but you know, I've been looking probably at each of you for 
at least a second or two during the course of this, some of you much more. Um, and if, I now, if you now gave me a quiz, you know, what color shirt is he wearing? <laughs> no idea. It's not what my task was, and I just don't register it. And I was looking for small, white, and round, and I'm looking at this black, shaggy thing. And, oh, oh. Doesn't register. Anybody else? Yep. So if I understood correctly, what your data basically, or the data that you showed us today basically indicate is that you can get faster, you can get more liberal, but not necessarily better in the sense of sensitivity, right? Oh, it's, okay, that, that's, so when you so become... So you, 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 it takes you less time to do the scan, so you become faster in a way, but not necessarily more accurate. No, you, you, when you become a radiologist, or when you do learn any of these tasks, you also have a huge increase in sensitivity, in, in D-prime. I should say a word about sensitivity, because you may end up reading this literature. In our literature, the literature of all of us here, sensitivity means D-prime, mostly. Um, in the medical literature, they use the same word to mean the hit rate, the true positive rate. And you can get into big arguments with your medical friends if you're talking. So I never use the word sensitivity in, um, in literature that I'm writing or grants that I'm writing that cross this medical psychology bound, because that's, that, that's an aside. But apart from, sensitiv apart from the, the language about sensitivity, um, look, if I put you in front of a string of mammograms right now and say, does this woman have cancer? your D prime is very close to zero. Um, if I look at an expert, that D prime is up to about 2.9, and that's very much learned. But at a certain point, you're right, that, 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 that the, the, the changes are, are not changes in, in D prime, they're changes in, um, uh, in, in criterion. Um, and you know, what you would like to do is to figure out because that means that if you, if you propose a, a chain, a, you know, a, 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 an intervention that reduces the miss rate, you might just be increasing the false alarm rate, and that's bad too. So what you really want is the intervention that does improve D prime, and it's difficult. Why do only the professors ask questions? Oh. Is he a professor yet? No, that's okay. Well, my question is, um, what, what do you think about mm, like, um, computational tools for feature extraction? Do you think that the bottleneck will be the point where these computational tools are based on the neural physiological way of computing and these will lead to get to the point where, close to the point where, uh, well, the radiologist is not trusting the algorithm, but is not trusting the algorithm because he, is not, he would not even trust another radiologist saying and the thing which is not the same which he thinks. I, well, I, I think you are pointing to the fact that um, for most of these kinds of tasks, um, there are a set of images that will always be ambiguous. That the computer, could, you know, the, the computer or, the, or a well-trained radiologist would both be unsure about this. And um, this is actually another problem with this kind of research. We're used to doing experiments where, you know, in visual search, let's say, you know if the target is present or not. You put it there. Um, getting stimuli where you know the truth for sure, unless you want completely trivial stuff, is very difficult in, this, in, in, in radiology because good radiologists disagree because these things are in, inherently ambiguous. And, and the standard 
for the, the gold standard for what is truth for, say, cancer is that it's proven by pathology, right? You went and did a biopsy, and the pathologist said, yes, that's cancer. Well, it turns out that the pathologist also isn't sure. And two pathologists, I mean, again, it's better than, you know, it's, it's not D prime of zero, but these stimuli are inherently ambiguous. So um, this is partly why a, a lot of the work in the uh, in, in, in sort of medicine is to find uh, biomarkers that go around the, 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 the visual stimulus altogether. Right? If, you, if you have a blood test that says, um, yes, if and only if you have cancer, that's very useful. You know, then you get away, get away from this. But for now, we're stuck with this, some of the stimuli being inherently ambiguous. Yeah. No. I mean, do you think that it will be possible to go over to the point where a human can detect, I mean, a, an algorithm can detect better than a human does, or? Yes, I think that should be possible. Um, if only because um, the algorithm is not limited by the, um, the front-end limitations of the human visual system. Let us suppose, for example, that um, there's uh, a, a, well, I suppose you could, you might, you might discover that there are signals that are essentially invisible to humans that the algorithm can pick up. Now, of course, if you found that, you could then make it visible to humans in the same way that all those x-rays were invisible to humans until you figured out how to make x-rays. But yeah, I think, I think there may well be signals in there that a, a human just wouldn't see. It's hard to, that's what, the, that's, that, that's the, the, the cool promise about um, deep learning networks, right? I don't know how it works, but it's magic and it works. And so that's good. If, and if the magic worked in the clinic, we'd use it. All right, oh, oh, no, out, oh, now all of a sudden there's way out in the cheap seats back. Oh, no, you don't get a chance. OK, so you have talked about uh, collaborative approaches between an algorithm that extracts features and a person that then maybe looks in particular at the, um, at the locations that that algorithm has pointed to. Has anybody tried using uh, a uh, competitive approach where, for example, the machine tries to outdo and find something where the human hasn't found anything and then maybe g gives the, the data back to the human which, who says, no, it's impossible that the machine has found something and so forth? Um, there are versions, uh, I, I, they're not usually described as competitive, but, but as collaborative where the um, computer only offers information um, at locations where the, um, uh, the, 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 the radiologist wants information. You know, so I say, what do you think about that? And the computer says, ah, nah, don't worry about that. Um, I haven't heard of a version where the computer deliberately tries to look where you, or, or uh, look for things where you didn't look in some sense. Though, um, one of the, but going back to the gorilla piece where people looked at the gorilla for, and, and still didn't call it, one of the things that has been tried um, and in small studies does work is if I track your eyes, um, you will, th th there, uh, sometimes you will look at something it will be puzzling enough that you will look at it quite a lot, but you won't call it cancer, and you won't particularly be aware of the fact that you spent time scrutinizing it. People are very bad at knowing where they have looked, right? Aren't we working on that paper? Oh, no, it's not, you're not on that one, I don't think. Yeah, yeah, but there's a second one. Anyway, people are very bad knowing where they're looking. Um, but the computer knows where you've looked, and so what it can do is say, um, Okay, you say you're done, but before you leave, 
take, the, take another look here. You spent a lot of time over there. And it can, the, another thing the computer can do is say, you say you're done, you know, you never looked at that quadrant at all. Maybe that's what you meant to do because it's like open sky, there's nothing there. But you, j just, just in case you were interested, and you can imagine this gets um, potentially more valuable if you're not just looking at one image, but now you're looking at that stack of images that you take for a, a CT image. Now you have to say, did I look at this entire 3D volume? And you can use the computer collaboratively to, to work with you on that. I haven't heard of the, I, I think actually if you wanted a competitive one, don't get a computer, get two radiologists. Because they are the most competitive people I have ever met. They hate to be wrong, which also makes them very difficult subjects to test. And they're intensely competitive about um, how they're doing. So, you know, get two, except it's too expensive, you know, get two radiologists side by side and say, who's the winning radiologist today? Except you probably increase the murder rate <laughs> or something. Um, I have a question related to how specifically humans, uh, how uh, this being so bad, basically, with our visual attention is specific to our human brain architecture and to what extent this is uh, something that we inherit from our uh, ancestors and so how, how do monkeys do with these uh, kinds of tasks? Your turn, Daniel. The, I, I think the short answer, I think, is um, that the, the bad part is bad, um, it looks particularly bad when you come to lectures like this, right, because we build things for you to, to miss. Um, and that what's really quite remarkable is how well we do most of the time. But I, I think that the constraints on um, why we are bad are uh, largely computational. You simply can't, af you can't afford to build a brain big enough to do everything everywhere all at once. And I think that you know, goes all the way down the, uh, that, that will go straight down the evolutionary ladder. And there's, there's, no, there's, there's no market in getting your cat to do radiology. Um, they're not going to be vast. Though it does turn out that um, uh, macaque monkeys you know, the, 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 the find the red vertical thing right. that I did earlier, macaque monkey is better than you at that. But it's, it's, it, it, it's quantitatively better. It's not doing something completely different. It's just that, uh, you know, the macaque isn't really worrying about his dinner reservation or something. And he's, uh, is that, does that seem fair to you, Daniel? I think so. Yeah. There's so, some interesting uh, group differences. Uh, there, there's data on um, autistic spectrum um, observers who are uh, in, on some tasks better at visual search tasks than, uh, um, than neuronormal normal patients. Um, and, you know, but, but basically, everybody's stuck with this problem. So the conjunction problem that leads you to be serial in your search is a some, something that is a universal I, I uh, feature would, of, I mean, as, as evolution near, haven't, haven't found a, a different way to approach this problem. It's a great theological issue, <laughs> right? If you're, if you're trying to figure out why you cannot really understand the mind of God, depending on your theology here, um, if you think about the idea of, 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 of something that, you know, some entity that was all-knowing, and would know every conjunction everywhere, you can't, you, 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 you can't wrap your brain around what this, would, what this experience would be like. Um, but we're not really going to talk about theology because that school must be up in Trento, right? This is only psychology oh, yeah. here. A... Well, something popped up in my mind. <laughs> uh, yes, That's good. sorry for the line, yes, sorry for the pun. Uh, 
Uh, I was just wondering, uh, we, you mentioned at the very beginning of your talk that there are some features that are quite easy to spot for, uh, for humans and some others which are very hard to. And going back to your uh, like, um, manipulations of uh, radiographies uh, with like high, high spatial or low spatial filtering, I was wondering maybe it's also looking at the same pictures under different uh, like, uh, manipulations will kind of make some features of the pictures more salient. For example, like maybe looking at a gorilla with the same picture once like normal picture and once filtered could somehow easy make make it easier to 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 cue your attention towards the anomalous thing. Oh yeah, ab absolutely. So so as one example of that, um, think about the this business of finding lung nodules, so little white sphere. The reason that's difficult is because vessels that are running through the um, the chest look like, um, you know, in cross-section, also look like white, um, like round white things. So when you're scrolling back and forth, you're looking for round white things that are popping on and off, which is very much what you're talking about. You're turning a static stim stimulus into a dynamic stimulus that attracts attention um, in the right way. Um, a radiologist um, typically will be sitting so you, you're, you've got x-ray data, right? It's, that's just a bunch of numbers. How am I going to project that? Well, you're going to do what's known in, in, in the medical physics land as window or, and level it. You've got 256, or maybe more, gray levels, and you've got um, you know, many, many numbers. You can put all 256 across the whole range, or you can window it and just look at these. You know, everything above this is white. Everything below this is black. Now you can take that window, if you want, and slide it up and down. And if you're looking at an abdominal CT image, one of those windows will make the bones stand out. One of those windows will be really good for looking at the liver and seeing if, there are, you know, if there's cancer in the liver or something like that. So they're doing exactly what you're describing, is trying to make the, the right features stand out. Oh, and you can see this sometimes at, uh, at the airport. Um, the, uh, the engineers who build the machines like to put gadgets on it. They don't bother necessarily doing the psychophysical study to see whether it makes any difference. But um, they have, for instance, the ability to just reverse um, positive negative on the image. And you can see, as, as if you look at the um, screeners as you go through the checkpoint, you can see some of them really love toggling that. So they're, they're just toggling the colors back and forth because they think that it's enhancing. Some, nobody's done the study to see if that's true, but, but they're, they're, they are working exactly on your, your hypothesis there. Daniel, do you want to? Oh, no, oh there is. Um, so I'd like to go back to the uh, comment that you made about uh, two radiologists that compete with one another and think of this situation in relation to the radiologist and the computer who's there to assist him and probably or maybe there is less competition with the computer. Um, well, this is not necessarily known, I mean it can go in various ways but my point is the following. So there was a study a couple of years ago that if you were to remember something and you type in this in a computer and, the, uh, and you're told that uh, by the end of the session uh, what you wrote in the computer will be erased or what you wrote in the computer will remain, uh, actually the memory that you have is worse in the case that you know that the computer will also memorize what you oh, wrote oh. there. Uh -huh. So is, is in the literature on uh, cognitive offloading. And I'm wondering whether there could be a similar issue also here when uh, you're searching for something and you know that there is another entity, either a person or a computer, that is also searching for something. One could say that actually this could make you worse if you're not in a competitive situation because you're offloading part of your processes in the mind of something else that can be the computer. And 
Now, I'll go to the speculative, widely speculative and provocative step and say maybe one reason why uh, for uh, as social species as we are and many other social species do not need to actually uh, become autistic in the way we find things in the environment is that we actually cooperate in searching. Oh, that that's going to make us... Well, I, so, so a, a whole arm of my research that I did not talk about here is um, foraging work, where you're looking for not just one target, but, but picking, uh, like picking berries. And um, you know, the, the foraging is an evolutionarily important and old behavior, and there's nice rules governing that behavior. Um, and there, you might see the opposite kinds of effects, because you've got um, the berry that he picks, you aren't going to get. Um, so I'm not sure if, the history, if, if our history of, of a species would encourage us to offload because the other guy will find it, or would encourage us to search more quickly and more ferociously because if I don't find it, Daniel will eat my berries. And, and, um, but I'm trying to think if there's a... Uh, I, 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 the, the cognitive offloading issue is interesting in, in these sorts of expert tasks because we now can count so much more on um, computer resources. If I'm not quite sure what this kind of cancer looks like, I no longer have to go down to the library and look for it. It will be immediately available on my, um, on my workstation. And I don't, uh, that, that, well, look, it certainly makes us all lazier in the rest of our lives, <laughs> right? I no longer know how to spell anything, and I no longer, I didn't know how to spell anything before, and I no longer um, uh, know anybody's phone number because I've offloaded it to my iPhone. And pretty soon I won't need to be embarrassed that I don't know any Italian because Google Translate will just take care of it all and you'll all have your, you know, you'll just all listen on, on your, your iPhone. Um, that's, I, I, the, the, the offloading thing is interesting. I'll have to think more about that to see if I can think of an example in the... Okay, does he... Last question. Okay, um, thinking in a more collaborative way between machines and human beings, would you train a neural network to recognize cancer uh, on uh, a set of images that, that are relevant for human beings? Or maybe you just try to, I don't know, choose another set of images that are not relevant for the feature of the human uh, vision? So, but, so the, the question is, do, do you want to train your uh, computer to do the task that a human vision, yeah. visual system is doing, or do you want to train it to do something else? Um, and this is you know, way, well outside my expertise, but I know that people work on both approaches. Right? One is, um, OK, I have a database of thousands of images. I know these have cancer and these have don't. Uh, these don't. I throw it all into. Um, uh, my deep network and see what comes out. And the other version that you are talking about is, okay, I have these thousands of patients. This one has cancer. This one doesn't. I throw everything into the network. I, you know, I throw their toenail color in there. I don't know if any of this is relevant, but I don't, if the network will give me the answer, I don't care. And there they're probably looking at something that... that, that but I, this, this, is, this is beyond my my knowledge. Okay. All right. Then we thank Jeremy again. Thank you. And uh, I don't want to stop discussion here necessarily. So uh, as uh, it is usual, we're going to meet with the speaker just down the road in uh, uh, Stapomato. Uh, and so there's great chance to uh, talk a little bit more with Jeremy and ask all sort of interesting questions, okay? See you there.